Season two, welcome disruptors and curious minds to the Thinking on Paper book club, the, the best, most immersive, entertaining, community-driven book club on emerging tech, leadership, and mindset connected to a podcast about emerging tech culture and business. Um, book two, The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. Now, I'll let you speak about this, Jamie, because I'll be honest, I'll, I'll be upfront with you. When you first recommended this book, I was dubious. I was like, hmm, really? The design everyday things? And I was wrong. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> Oh, that's great, man. I, you know, one other, one other thing that's, that's really interesting about this is just some of the feedback we've been getting, you know, on these, on these book clubs, um, or on these seasons of book clubs, you know, you could do it one of two ways. You could read it with us or you could not read the book. And I think we're getting value out of these short little snippets, uh, either way, but, um, yeah, the design of everyday things, I think it'd be interesting. Cause I was, when I read books, I, I tend to find jump off points to other books within the book. And there was something in the Nexus that we read that basically has design at the center as this bridge between, you know, emerging technology, culture, the, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And I'm like, this is one of the premier design books. Like this is, this is kind of what people who go to school for design and UX and that sort of thing, I think is part of that curriculum. So I was like, Hey, Let's jump into it and do it. So, um, yeah, first chapter. And, and also one of Don Norman's other books is called Living with Complexity, which kind of had a nice synergy with Nexus as well. So I think, I don't know, if Don Norman's watching this, get in touch. Come on, thinking on paper. That would be great. That would be great. Yeah, so the so chapter one is, is a tiptoe into the book, right? You know, yeah. it, it kind of gets us centered around kind of the idea of, you know, intentional design versus like, BS design, right? Yeah. Um, one of the things I found funny in, in this just to start off, and we're probably going to jump all over the place, but uh, whenever, so. you, whenever you see it, whenever you see a sign explaining how to use something, that means the design is shit, right? So I like, I thought that was, I thought that was pretty cool, right? I, I, I um, what did he call that? So, okay, we'll get into um, affordances and signifiers and constraints and mapping and feedback, kind of the the early foundations of good design. I just wanted to bring in a few of my bad designs. So if you have some, I was trying to think of some really awesome good designs. And obviously other than my guitar, I couldn't really think of anything positive, but loads of really bad designs um, from websites. Um, I think the Amazon website is really badly designed. It's not intuitive. I don't like it has signifiers all over the place. There's too much going on. Um, my oven, my dishwasher, my kettle, my washing machine. Does your kettle <laughs> look like this one? Does it look like this one with the with the spout and the handle on the same side? I feel for your hand if that's the case. Almost. We'll get to yeah. I know, but you know, he talks about feedback and the feedback of devices. And like I can hear my dishwasher now beeping away to tell me that it's finished. And it's been beeping away for 20 minutes to tell me it's finished. And I was like, God. Come well, on. so the feedback, I'm going to jump on a couple of those things because, you know, we're just going to kind of bounce around. But, you know, the feedback uh, thing is really interesting to me because uh, if feedback becomes, if there's too much feedback, it becomes noise, right? If there's yeah. too much noise, not enough signal, right? If there's a right, so finding the right amount of feedback to give is is super important because then then it makes it meaningful. So I start thinking about, uh, you know, I point to like sound, right? And, and sound and feedback and user interfaces and that sort of thing. Like when you go to a, um, go to buy something, you know, and there's like a point of sale device where you put your credit card in or whatever, you know, there's, there's always that awkward, um, you know, you're the, you're the teller, you're the, you're the clerk, you know, ringing me up, I'm doing the payment and we're sitting there and we're like, is it going? Is it not going? We don't know whether to talk or not talk. Cause I'm waiting to see if the thing's done. But when there's like a nice little beep that goes bing, it's like, oh, I've done my job right. It's a nice rewarding bing. So, you know, when I see that, I get excited, you know, the simple pleasures, but also Duolingo. Have you ever messed around with Duolingo, that app? Yeah, I, I, I'm a linguist. Yeah, yeah, I have. Oh, right. So I, I remember when I first jumped into that, it it gave these really positive, short and sweet little notifications that you're on the right track, right? So I think I think sound and feedback is is pretty interesting if if done the right way. It's a good example of good design is the Duolingo app. I think it's although they did a massive update 
kind of late last year and everything changed and it was whoa you're gonna get used to that new design should we back up for people who are wondering what the hell we're talking about <laughs> <laughs> um essentially this book is about good design and what i like about this book is that um it's not just about websites it's about services it's about lectures it's very interdisciplinary i think a lot of the things we're going to learn reading this book are very actionable in our working lives no matter what you're doing if, even if, if you're designing spreadsheets if you're designing decks for business if you're if you're design if you're an actual designer designing uh web web three websites there's something in here because the skills and the ideas are applicable across domains um and i think good design is good design so a lot to learn for people there's yeah and 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 the the to kind of start us off as we dip our toe into this like what what is good design and the, and the way the author kind of sketches this out is in two pieces you know one is discoverability and one is understanding yep and and kind of the way i the way i kind of wrap my brain around at least the discoverability side is is there's got to be like an intuitive nature to it right there there's got to be it, you, you got to just be able to flip it open and you know or step into it or you know become a part of it and i can really figure out how it works just by being in it for a second right yeah that kind of link so yeah he mentioned discoverability and understanding um what you that intuition it appears with design so there's a quote on page 31 how do we form an appropriate conceptual model for the devices we interact with? We cannot talk to the designer, so we rely upon whatever information is available to us, what the device looks like, what we know from using similar things in the past, what were told to us in the sales literature, et cetera. So I think that intuition comes from experience, and that's part of the discoverability of the design. You work with a lot of music software, I think. So mm -hmm. you probably have very first-hand experience of complex design where you have to follow your intuition and discover these these softwares. Do, do some brands do it better than others? Yeah, I think so. I, I got into like the you know digital audio workstation space, which basically is like you know, the equivalent of a mixer and microphone and uh, or mixer in console and, and outboard gear, but it's all in hyper the hyper complex to somebody who has no experience of those things. Right. But also th it's interesting too, based on your previous experience. So if your market is used to using an existing tool, right? So I'll, I'll say uh, in the audio world, I, I, I grew up digitally in pro what's called Pro Tools. Yeah, company no, called sure. avid you know avid runs it and i used it so much there are these amazing little shortcuts when you're editing audio keyboard shortcuts that you know i got so good at it where i wasn't even looking at what i was doing i was just my hands were moving and then my buddy who i was collaborating with he's like oh you got to try logic logic is amazing the sounds are better uh the libraries are great the tools are great it's very intuitive and i got in there and none of my apple none of my uh, pro tools shortcuts worked so i was like this sucks Right. Even though like the 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 um, the outputs were way better, the quality of the sounds were way better and a lot of the stuff. And then they eventually integrated the Pro Tools keyboard shortcuts into Logic, which is, you know, you think about the people that you're targeting, the your your audience, your the, yeah. the people that are about your product, you know, how do they behave? And there was an interesting point in here that a lot of engineers design products for how they want their audience to behave and not, not to how, how they behave, behave right? Yeah. Which I was like, God, that's really true. Cause a lot of engineers are really smart people. And they're like, well, these, if they don't do, if, if my audience doesn't do this, they're idiots, right? Um, but you know, you gotta really design for the people that wanna push the push the pay button, right? Really smart. I think what you just said, maybe that, and, and I, I wrote that quote down as well by people, designers designed for how they think people are, not how they are. I think Web3 has a massive problem in that with everyone who's in Web3 thinks that everyone signing up to Web3 knows about blockchain and has a, a wallet. You also, I think Freudian slipped in Apple there. You were speaking about Pro Tools and Logic, but you mentioned Apple and that's another one because I, I've never used Apple on Android. And I think that the interface of Android. I know it. I know how it works across different devices. And I, 
I assume, or I know Apple is the same and it's very intuitive and it's you, I think you're Apple, but you'd find it very difficult to go to Android and I would find it very difficult to go to Apple. But it'd be interesting actually, who would, who would, who would um, get used to the, 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 the design quicker, me going to Apple or you going to Android? We should try that. That would be an interesting experiment because I've always wanted to mess around with 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 that side of the fence. But there there's a massive barrier to like people, you know, so your existing patterns, right? Sometimes your existing patterns and your experiences, uh, you know, wouldn't serve you well by holding on to those patterns, right? But but changing, it's the old dog, new tricks kind of mentality. Like I've got I've got four kids, I'm doing I've got a couple of businesses, I have a you know, a show and a book club with you, like. Do I have time to learn something new? So, I mean, that's a limiting factor. And if, if I were to learn something new, it damn sure has to be fun and it has to be intuitive. So, I mean, this is why there's some, there, I think there's going to be some great gems in this book to apply to a lot of stuff, even that we build, right? Yeah, that definitely with what we build. I mean, with, with thinking of making a, you know, a, a brand book for thinking on paper, building a book club, you, yeah, the design of how you do that is applicable um should we speak about the the five initial foundations of good design that um don norman speaks about and you can explain the first one because it took me a while to understand that one affordances signifiers constraints mapping and feedback now maybe the, the best way to talk through this would be to have an example of something that everyone is familiar with maybe a, I, I, what, what do you think? Um, a, a game, a computer game, maybe? On is it phone? weird that I just got like test anxiety um, based on the question that you just asked that I now have to recall my information? No, it's so <laughs> funny. Um, no, I think, I think affordance, this was really interesting because it took me a minute to get my head around it. And I think people, the, the author talks about people confusing affordances and, and signifiers, right? Yeah. Um, but what I found interesting about affordances is it's this, it's a relationship, right? It's, it's a relationship between, uh, kind of the properties of the product or the experience and the capabilities of the person using it. I think that's that's like this. It's this really cool intersection of those two things coming together, and and attempting to help make an experience you know more navigable. Would you would you say that the affordances? I mean, okay, if you took the, I think in the in the book he uses the example of like TripAdvisor or something equivalent to TripAdvisor, but for restaurants. And if you go on TripAdvisor, the affordances are what you can do on the app. So you can scroll up, scroll down, swipe left, swipe right. But the signifiers tell you where you can do that. So obviously everyone knows to swipe left and swipe right, but swiping up and down to access different parts of information, sometimes that needs a signifier. So a, a hint, some kind of directional cue to... Yeah, I think I, I, I wanted... I'd probably think about it a little more simply in that, like, a, let's think about a door. I think he references a door, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the the door is something that's designed to to open and close and allow ingress and egress, right? Um, so, like, affordance, the affordance is, like, this door lets you do something, right? Yeah. It lets you get in and out of the building. And then a signifier for the door might be just that, you know, that little handle that appears, right? That, you know, in that one, I think that one example, it was like a bunch of glass doors and there were no handles and you couldn't, see, yeah. you couldn't see the hinges of the door. And this dude was like caught in the middle trying to figure out how to get in and out. Um, that didn't have any signifiers, right? But a signifier would be me being able to see the hinge in the door, me looking at the handle. The affordance is the function of the door letting me get into the building. That's how I think about it. Yep. Uh, yep. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So the, if the fornices is what is available and then signifies what or where or how you access it. Mapping is what we spoke about earlier about having spatial context, intuition of what should do what in a normal world based on your experience of whatever the product is. Um, my, my example of that would be walking into a room and looking at a row of light switches on your right. Yeah. And then as you flip the light switches, that would correspond the closest light switch to the closest light, the furthest light switch to the furthest light kind of thing. 
yeah, you'll you'll need that when you're doing your right to know you lectures in those big lecture halls, Jeremy. So that's exactly right. We'll to... That's exactly right. Soon to come. Yeah. Um, feedback. We spoke about that. So good design has the right level of feedback to know to let you know a user know that a task or has been completed or some kind of indication for what to do next. Perhaps constraints. What what was what was your taking on constraints? Because I couldn't really, he seemed to miss out constraints. Yeah, I didn't really get a lot of, you know, uh, concrete example or grounded knowledge in that aspect yet as it was written in the first chapter. Yeah, okay. um, good, because I, I, I'm the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The mapping thing makes sense. The feedback thing makes sense. The signifiers, the affordances um, make sense. Um, you know what I started thinking about? And I wrote this down because um you know the, the the future of experiences are starting to rely on game engines right and game engines produce things very differently than you know what we're recording here is very linear content if this was done in a game engine there'd be a bit more choose your own adventure capability certain things driving certain reactions and, and that sort of thing i wonder if like game design principles are now starting to bleed into product design a little bit because you know products are going to be experiences they're going to be these digital experiences rather than you know concrete products i don't know what i thought of that as just a thought starter that maybe we can track through the chapters do you could you expand on that so when so essentially everything becomes gamified it's it's almost like so it goes back to i'll bring up a thinking on paper coin term the bi-directional value exchange right so there's yeah. there's yeah to you, right there's input that affects the outcome of the experience right so where um i don't know like if i'm looking at, so i've got this nalgene bottle that i carry around with me to drink water every day you know th nothing nothing changes if i drink the water this way or if i turn it and drink it this way but you know, in, in game design, if I approach something in a digital experience from the front, it might be different than how I approach it from the back or, or the side or whatever, right? So there are more options, there's more quantum and oh, less. Yeah. I was, when you said that, I was thinking it could be infinite. In fact, it could be a bottle that you drink out from the other side, you can go around the back and it's some kind of portal to a, to a world populated by dragons or something. Yeah, there, there, there's almost infinite options I like. I like how you're thinking about that. Yeah. And also why this book is so good, because what we're going to read about and learn in this book is applicable both to that water bottle and a gamified world. Absolutely. So let me ask you a question. So chapter, the first chapter in any book, it to me is, is like, all right, can I hang out in this world for a bit? Can I, can I, is this, is this pulling me in? Um, and, you know, has this first chapter, kind of stirred the pot enough for you to like jump into the rabbit hole of this thing. How are you feeling about like how we set the stage in the first chapter? Well, what did I say to you at the beginning? I said, when, when you first mentioned this, I was dubious, mm -hmm. uh, mostly because of my internal biases about des what design is, mm -hmm. um, which I'm, and, and yeah, I, I loved it. I thought it was really applicable, really interesting. And I'll never look, at anything already after one chapter I, I don't i'm not looking at things in the same light i'm trying to find like where the signifier is on on a on, a, on an object or you know what what the feedback is and, and you know how it maps to my experience so yeah very into the design well, that's very cool like it sounds like it, it flipped a switch in this new perspective you're starting to look through and i i think so as well i love frameworks i know you love frameworks this is a framework to understand design and not just visual design right we you know a lot of people think design it's like oh that's like logo and you know chair. websites or a chair or a building right i'm an architect i'm going to design a building right but you know experiences and you know um experiences i think are big to think about how you design right but it, it's everything. It's everything that what it's everything that people interact with, I think. Yeah. I, I, I yeah, everything we interact with is designed by someone. That everything like I, I'm sitting on this desk and like literally every single thing in my entire existence 
started out as a design on a piece of paper or a napkin or a computer but it's that's what it started from that so i mean i think that is enough in itself to learn more about how i have a nice enjoyable experience with some of my things that come into my life and how some of the other devices and experiences and websites really piss me off so looking forward to chapter two um do you get an insight on chapter two what is chapter two about i haven't dove into that yet uh on chapter two uh but i'm I'm definitely looking forward to it maybe let's throw a couple of quotes uh i wrote down a couple of quotes that i think will be interesting to track as we move along is you know it's the duty of machines um to um let's see wait 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 it's the it's the duty of the machines that those of which that we design to understand the people right it's it's not the people's responsibility to understand the machine it's the machine's responsibility to understand people that's a whole like ai rabbit hole right because i think technology in general has a design problem and i think he alludes to it in the book so that, that that's going to be an interesting thread to explore then you know you know engineers just saying well i can do this why can't mark well mark's not an engineer right you know so it's like you know I don't know. I, I, there are a lot of interesting things to track on this, I think. Agreed. Let's save those for chapter two. Well, Amazing. Think, yeah. How do we, it, how do we want to close this? With a call to arms, I think if you've got this far and you're not family or friends, or if you are family or friends, share this with somebody you think would like to talk and learn about this about the design of everyday things in this example but to join the thinking on paper book club um and again some of you hey some of you guys will want to just listen to these videos which is great uh, i you know i i told mark i would do these if no one was listening and i think there's at least two people listening right now so that's good thanks mom thanks dad um i i, I think if you're reading the book and you want to process it pr process it in ways that we're processing it We'll bring you in on one of these squares in the next episode and, and you can come in and share your thoughts and tell us what you're thinking because we want to learn from you as well. Yeah, do it. I can recommend it. it. It really does help even just with what we've done. It helps us to synergize. It'll help you to do the same. So that's it. Come and join us. See you next time, guys.